Just testing the earlier. I can't hear anything. Is that?
got um, like when the Hebrew is he said he's getting
have been reached to pay on that. Oh, no, they haven't. I suppose we are upgraded system very well. No, no. Oh, the um, yeah, he said he said he's not going to be stuck with the bedroom. Oh, you will have to get the ball. And I think we have to be very welcome to the very many of this space association of Australia. Hello to you.
features and interviews that, that Andrew and the other members do, they go up into the uh, archive and so you can program, I think it's like 1600 video, uh, sorry, audio features in there going back to 1993, I think. But I was, that, no, no, I was a little, um, we did we get some pretty cool people uh, involved with our group, but this is actually Charlie Duke, and he'll be more about him very shortly. We'll be heading into the Space Association uh, Space Show uh, Studios, four years ago now, and had an extensive interview with him, uh, and it was fascinating. We also run uh, the Australian Space Network, uh, a meetup group, and the idea of that is that it's, um, it's kind of a catch all uh, directory of space. Uh, activities around the country, so not just Melbourne, anywhere in the country, whether it's Mars Society, whether it's um, Space Industry Association, whether it's a new movie that's come out or whatever. So if you're joining up today is free and plug in, you're plugging your phone and much interest in, you'll come up and tell you about what's happening. And if you go, if you have to go to Sydney for the next week, you'll see whatever that is happening in Sydney. So that's what this page kind of looks like. So um, you go to our website, just space.asm.au, and links to it our space network. That was me, sorry. Okay, so it's a special event. Your time is up. Hey, one call. Um, okay, we'll also do special events uh, like we've uh, done. We've had um, Neil Armstrong, his biographer, actually spoke for us in this building downstairs a couple of years ago. That was fascinating. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, we've partnered with the promoters of uh, the Buzz Walden Tour, and we've got other movie events and that sort of thing. So it's in the space, it's kind of cool. We also partner with other organisations as well as our hotel. We partnered with Engineers Australia and um, Royal Aeronautical Society, and we had um, this gentleman, Ed Blaine Sice, who's a current serving ISS uh, flight director. So he came out and uh, did a fascinating talk, and he uh, spoke to a couple of people uh, in the city, so that was a really good night. Lots of um, so once again, I'd like to thank the uh, RMIT Space Technology Group. Uh, now, the Space Association, um, we have uh, partnered with uh, this organisation called Live On Stage Australia, and they've had a particular theme over the years, and I think we've somewhat influenced them, I'd like to think. Um, uh, they've had a number of high profile space identities, primarily astronauts and primarily moonwalking astronauts. So they've got an event coming up uh, this coming May across the country called Mission Control, the Unsung Heroes of Apollo. Now that's actually a movie a documentary put together by uh, some American producers and that talks about those guys in Mission Control, Mission, uh, were guys primarily, in Mission Control that control and manage all of the uh, Apollo missions. And it's interviews with the various people uh, talking about things, events that happened during that time and, and how they came to be there. It's supposed to be really good, I haven't seen it myself. But the big thing about this is that this Apollo, uh, I'm pointing my laser pen at this clip. This guy here is Charlie Duke. He uh, was the lunar module pilot on Apollo 16. He landed on the moon with John Young in, uh, in, in 1972. Uh, and they had a moon rover that goes down and puts a whole lot of rocks. So he is coming out. He's, uh, he's 70 now, not quite that sure that is, but he's getting up there. But he's getting healthy and getting around there. Look, there's only five of the original 12 people that walked on the moon, only five of them still walking on the Earth. So uh, they're a diminishing uh, commodity. And uh, so this would be a really good opportunity to, to see him. And uh, so he's on stage doing a Q&A um, after the movie. Um, and people, as well as walking on the moon, again, as well as walking on the moon, he was actually the voice, if people watched the video of Neil Armstrong and Brother Aldrin landing on the moon, uh, the guy that the guy they were both talking to in Mission Control was one Charlie Duke. So he's the guy that says, uh, we copy it down, we're about to turn blue, we're breathing in, thanks a lot, that's him, that's Charlie. So, yeah. Now, so just recently announced that um, this gentleman, uh, flight director Jerry Griffin, is actually coming out as well. He's, he's coming on the tour as well. So he's a, a fascinating guy himself. So he'll be on stage with Charlie 
talking about uh, the movie, talking about the events at the time, and also taking questions. So I'm not quite certain how that question will be happened. It's a Q&A. Lisa Harvey Smith is moderating the event, so it's, it's <coughs> Melbourne, it's on, uh, I don't know, it's, it's on the camera, you go into the camera, or vice versa, New South Wales, etc., etc. et cetera, so it's, um, you're the camera person, you win. Well, that's right, there's only a few people So membership for the association is $50 for full membership and $25 for students, pensioners, and people are very good with that. Um, no, that's not, that's $75 for the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just another little thing that's coming to the in tray for the associations is that there's some people that are documentary, but it kind of gets the flavour of our contribution to the Is it the kind of an explanation to the young people of what the stamp is actually used for? Yeah, well, exactly. It's a good job. Um, uh, yes. It'll be pleasant, I think, with that That's right. So, yeah, so it um, should be nice. So, basically, what they're asking us to do as members and friends is to write into Australia Post and <coughs> urge them to create a uh, community stamp. Um, so, this is the address here. If you want that uh, address, we can send it to you or we might put it up on the website if you want it. Um, but I think it'd be great for that. And um, this is my suggestion, but. Uh, <laughs> Okay, name that movie. The Rock and Magic. The Rock and Magic. Fantastic. Anyone with grey hair can probably name it. Yeah. Alright, so that's good. Really cool. So don't be too forceful about your demand, just say this is a great idea, this is the reason why, etc. etc. Um, they did produce a Hitty Diversity stamp for um, Reset, which uh, was a little while ago, which was great. And um, so I think it's got a lot of possibilities. So, and they've also, in the past, they have done the 50th anniversary of, of, um, of, the spa of, of space when, uh, when that came about a few years ago. So, this is the stamp set that they produced then. Um, so, it's not a piece of All right. So, um, this is, I'm just about to finish it off. So, um, once again, Space Association membership, uh, we urge you, A, if you are a member, to Make sure your members are up to date and current on the table. If your membership is expiring here, then you should get an automatic email from the system. If not, uh, contact us. Um, if you'd like to join up, it's a great opportunity. You could be in, you know, in the uh, in the draw, you could be in the tickets. Uh, Tim's over here for the red dollar. Uh, you he will take your money. Hey? Did you know it was going to be here tonight? Oh, well, you're, you're reliable. Um, so you can do that. and. Um, Basically, your membership funds our activities at these meetings, uh, the AV work, the radio show, the streaming, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it all helps. So with that, I'm going to stop talking because you've probably heard quite enough of me. And I'm going to hand over to our news correspondent, Angelo Garcia. Thank you, Mark. 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 Thank you, Yeah, you can just plug it into it if you want. Okay. That's good to go. And I'll just let you. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, um, well welcome, uh, my name's Angelo Di Grazia, I'm a long uh, standing member of the association and uh, uh, myself with, uh, with Mike will usually present uh, sort of space news, what we call space news, but it's a little hodgepodge of everything, so uh, let's start, there's a lot to cover but I'll try to keep it to about 30 minutes. Uh, the first thing I would like to talk about is Washington Rounder, of course, and the 2019 NASA budget request. There's some good news and there's some bad news. Uh, the United States shall, that's what uh, the presidential, Mr. Trump, uh, space policy directive talks about, uh, to do all sorts of things, but essentially the change this time around 
was to direct NASA to go back to the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. As you know before Trump, it was Mars first. Now this is the budget, 19.9 billion. Uh, now that's a third, $370 million increase to last year's request. So that's a good thing. Uh, it also speaks about conducting uncrewed SLS Orion first flight in 2020, leading to Americans around the moon in 2023. And they'll do a swing around the moon. So at least they're, they're heading back that, in that direction. Not to land, but they're talking about landing perhaps in the 20s, late 20s. The other things, the other highlights, is achieves early human exploration milestone by establishing a lunar orbital platform gateway. Eagle will talk about that tonight. Uh, develops a series of progressively more capable robotic lunar missions. They will start uh, this year, next year. You'll see uh, several robotic uh, missions go to the moon and begins a transition to commercialise uh, low Earth orbit. Uh, and one of the big ones is obviously uh, drop funding to the International Space Station by 2025. 24 25. What they're going to do is they're going to throw $150 million into establishing uh, or to promote commercialisation of space stations through people like Bigelow, uh, Astra and a few other organisations that are looking at these activities. Um, continues robotic exploration of the solar system, including the uh, obviously the rover 2020, that's still on the cards. Continues exploring the universe with the launch of James Webb. That will go up on an Ariane later this year, or is it next year? Anyone know? This year? Yeah, next, next year. Too, next next year. year. Okay. Providing a program to guide the system. All right. And then, of course, they've got other functions that NASA fulfill, like uh, the aeronautics bit. It's part of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So you'll see that there's uh, a number of things. The exploration systems. There's obviously uh, a focus on commercial crew and various James Webb and various other bits. And this is the budget. The takeaway for this though, is you'll see that 2018 was 19.5 billion, and it's now 19.8, but have a look at the following years. So this thing about NASA landing on the moon, um, <clears throat> tall order, they're gonna struggle. That's the truth of it, because they're flat budgets over the next four years. Moving on. Orion gets the tick. The SLS gets the tick. The upgrade of the NASA facilities get the tick. The Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway gets the tick. The commercial crew gets the tick. Uh, and Europa Clipper, fortunately, gets the tick. James Webb, still going up. The losers, the ISS, We'll go. Uh, so that's, that's um, they want to either, there's no money to deorbit the thing if that's what they choose to do. Uh, no one has come up and said we'll buy it. And uh, so it's, a, it's an issue. The other one was a real, one of the great observatories was the W First Telescope. And that's been cancelled. And it's based on the fact that the costs have been escalating over time. So they've cancelled that, which is a shame. It's one of the big Hubble, James Webb, W first series of you know huge telescopes. Earth science missions have uh, got the flick. So again, they've had a crack at getting rid of the Office of Education. There is no money for Mars infrastructure upgrades. A lot of the infrastructure around Mars is uh, now getting old and will decay over the years. Um, and there is no money for manned lunar landers. So good luck. But the Senator Bill Nelson, who you know is the next shuttle astronaut, basically said the administration's budget for NASA is a non-starter. This is what happened last time. Last year the same sort of thing happened. Okay, cancelled space station, cancelled W first, cancelled Earth Science and Office of Education. Cancelled? Still not going ahead. You wrote the lander. And Congress is really big on this thing. Okay, so that's uh, the now we'll talk about SpaceX. Of course, they've been in the news of recent times. And of course, the big one is the Falcon Heavy. That's what it looks like. It's basically three Falcon 9s <coughs> strapped together. 
And I think Elon at the time of launch, uh, early February, said, uh, you know, it was a 50-50 chance uh, that it uh, would work. Uh, and this is what it sort of compares to. That's the new SLS, that's a Saturn V. That's the new um, Origin uh, New Glenn, Delta Heavy, and uh, Vulcan, and the Shuttle. That's what it looks like with the new class of boosters. Um, what I enjoy, that, that's the Falcon Heavy, but have a look at this thing. This is the BFR, this is the 2017 version, this is the one they're building now, SpaceX. That was the one that they envisaged in 2016. But have a look at the size of this thing compared to the Blue Origin, even the Saturn V. That's the full version SLS, uh, which won't be flying till probably the 30s. So that full 130 tonne lifter will not be available till then. And there it is. Amazing pictures here. Um, on a strong back, that's the old pad 39A where the Apollo 11 went to the moon. But just to give you the size perspective of this thing, how about the people on the bottom? So it's a very, very big rocket. And see the bloke there? Huge. I like this picture, so I'll put it in there. Uh, there it is again. There it is lifting off. That's uh, that, that many engines hadn't sort of flown since, what was it? The M1. Yeah. M1, M1. <laughs> back in the uh, 70s. And the M1s didn't actually get to orbit. They usually blew up before that. Um, I like that picture, so I put it in there. It's just slow. It's slow? It's never going to get anywhere at that speed. Here's another one, a bit of a close up. I like that picture, so I'll put it in there. Uh, I love that picture. That's brilliant. So we had enough of the rocket porn. Come on. Keep going. All right. And of course, the two side boosters landed simultaneously at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, this is a nice one. 2015, 2018, and 2021. <laughs> and then, of course, they launched Starman as the payload. And these are pictures that we had the video playing earlier of him just flying around and there's little gadgets in there and it's got made by Earth, the on Earth by humans. Elon has a bit of a sense of humour if you haven't figured Elon Musk out by now. And that's uh, one of the recovered cores that was on display at the uh, visitor centre uh, next to Atlantis. So pretty cool. Look at the, uh, the wearing on it. And this is the hinge mechanism of the, um, the grid fins. And there's a grid fin. I'd love to know the aerodynamics of that thing. It's shaped like that for a very good reason, but I, I don't know why, but fascinating. They're titanium now too. They're very Yeah, the ones that they use were titanium. The old ones used to melt, the aluminium ones, so they put the titanium ones. And this is obviously the engine. You can see that that's got a whole stack of insulation around the engines, but uh, that's the core. And I want to play this video.
Sure. So there you go. Pretty good, huh? Uh, now, that with that launch, the single launch capacity doubled that day. The heaviest lift rocket up until that day was the Delta uh, Heavy. Sorry, the Delta Heavy. And the Delta Heavy can lift 30 tonnes to low Earth orbit. Um, the Falcon Heavy can lift 60, 64 tonnes, fully expandable version, to low Earth orbit. So it's double the capacity. The Moon and Mars is within reach. Of what? Eh? Of what? Of cargo. It's not man-rated. Uh, it's not man-rated, but that's, the, that's my technicalities. Uh, the interesting thing though here is the scale, the dollars, the, the value. That thing there, you can find estimates from 450 to 600 million dollars per launch. The Falcon Heavy in its expendable form is 160 million dollars. So there's a lot of people at NASA now who are about to spend 10 billion dollars more to finish the SLS before it flies, um, who are now starting to look at this thing, the Falcon Heavy. Uh, Ten billion dollars buys you a lot of Falcon Heavy. Anyway, that's just by the by. The other thing that was interesting, because Elon Musk is on a mission to recover all his stuff. Now, the other the other day, a Paz a mission patch, uh, a Paz was launched. It was a, a Spanish satellite, I think. But and this was a reused booster, fantastic. And. You know, when they fly from Vandenberg, they keep getting these fantastic shots of staging and look at that, you know. I'm mean, going to be fantastic to be in LA to watch that. Um, he also launched not only the Spanish um, uh, satellite, he also launched a couple of his microsats, which are the basis of his uh, internet-enabled satellite system. He proposes to launch four and a half thousand satellites over the next Oh, I don't know, six years, I guess, uh, to actually establish this. But he's not the only one. Iridium's there, you've got uh, OneWeb, there's a whole stack of them that are trying to do this. So Microsats don't do it justice either. Now, they're, they're over 400 kilos each, and they're a metre by 70 by 70 centimetres, so they're not really a Microsat. They're Microsats. And he actually called them, uh, I forgot what they called them, Tintin A or Tintin B. This is, but the takeaway on this was he tried to recover the fairing. The fairing is the top bit, uh, and he wants to recover these from space. And this is an animation to show you what he was trying to do. Uh, the fairing is guided, it opens up parafoils, and it lands on a ship, and they catch it. How crazy is that? Okay. <coughs> he bought this uh, boat called Mr. Stephen. These are the specs of it, <laughs> and he put a big net on it, <laughs> and he sailed it out to the to the ocean, <coughs> and it, it actually didn't quite catch it. Missed it by I forget 100 metres or something. By that much, but it fell into the ocean, and they've actually there it is. They've recovered it and brought it back to to the shore. But the idea is still to catch this thing. So he's moving ahead, trying to make every part of this rocket recoverable. Yeah, six million bucks each for that. So it's pretty amazing, and that's some detail. He's going to try the fairing. He'll get, he'll perfect that. Then he'll move on to recovering the second stage. That's where it's headed. Space launch system, Orion. This is the big, uh, you know, it's a monster, but it will take us to Moon and Mars and beyond. And at the moment, in 2020, we're going to see this rocket go up. It's called the Block One, and it will take purely one mission uh, around the moon, uh, no men. 2023, then we'll go on in the Block One B, and then we'll have there's a cargo version, and then the full stack uh, Block Two version. And they, you know, they progressively go from 70 tons below Earth orbit to 130. And this is the sort of cutaway. You'll see the Orion capsule, the escape thing, you'll see the solid rocket boosters. This is shuttle-derived equipment. Uh, it's being built as we speak. Um, these are the various configurations. And 
These are the bits and pieces that are now going together for the mission in 2023. They're doing tests to recover. That's the service module, as it was probably a month ago. They've been doing tests of the escape system and the parachute system. They built the core stage. Uh, they're going to. That's inside one. That's probably EM one, exploration mission one. That's the inner stage going into the Pegasus barge, and they are doing testing of all the core stages and all the components now for such structural integrity. Uh, this is an old shot. This is one of the test stands at uh, Stennis in the Mississippi, and that brings back a few memories from a few years back. Same stand, but now they're reconfiguring it for SLS. There's the uh, interim cryogenic uh, propulsion stage. They will have a new version with four engines on it called the Exploration Upper Stage for the main version coming up. There's the solid rocket motors, uh, and of course they've been testing the engines. That's what they look like. And the engines themselves, um, one of the most reliable engines that they've ever built because they are fantastic. They, they're actually reused shuttle engines that they're going to launch on the first four SLSs, but they're building a version D, not for disposable, but uh, uh, they're, they're making a mass-produced version of those engines where they can use, they'll throw them away essentially. And these, this was a recent test the other day, and they rated this to 113% of because it's thrust level, and they ran it for about I forget, 500 seconds or whatever the time was, so they really gave a, a thrashing the other day. But of course they're upgrading all the NASA facilities. Uh, that tower has been the subject of controversy of late. Uh, they reckon it's twisted and it tilts. And as luck would have it, it tilts towards the rocket. <laughs> but NASA are also angling to get another one built to take this off the critical path because after the exploration mission one goes up, they have to um, Extend it, and rather than extend it, build one, a new one now, and move on. And this is the vertical assembly building, and it's now been configured to accommodate the space launch system. And here's a movie. This is exploration mission. In the one. next eight minutes, you'll experience a 25 and a half day mission from rollout to recovery. The first integrated flight test of the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system rocket launching from the Kennedy Space Center is about to unfold. This is the first of many missions to come that will use the Deep Space Exploration System to prepare our team, our ship, and our astronauts for human operations in deep space. Rollout from the Vehicle Assembly Building signals that launch is near. Sitting atop the mobile launcher, the crawler transporter moves along the crawler way towards historic launch pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center at a top speed of one mile an hour. After traveling over four miles, rocket and the spacecraft climb up a ramp and are positioned over a flame trance. Once in position, the mobile launcher is lowered out to support post and the crawler is rolled away to a safe distance. Final checks are performed at the pad, including crew cabin closeout, via the access arm sitting over 300 feet above the surface of the launch pad. The launch date is set and the teams are prepared for the mission that is about to occur. At sunrise on launch day, engineers in the launch control center have already powered up the spacecraft and the rocket and loaded the core stage and upper stage with cryogenic fuel. As launch window open approaches, final checks are performed and when all systems are go, terminal countdown is initiated. The big physics of launch are about to be put on full demonstration. Umbilical plates weighing hundreds of pounds await their cue to retract and clear the path of the rocket at liftoff. Some mounted on arms the size of tractor trailers. The mighty core stage engines are prepared for engine start as they are thermally conditioned for an onrush of cryogenic fuel and the heat of ignition. At T minus 15 seconds, sound suppression is activated, cascading water into the flame trench to dampen the acoustic shock. And as the core stage engines achieve full throttle, shock diamonds appear. At booster ignition, the flame trench is flooded with fire. At first motion, all umbilical arms are retracted and the rocket clears the tower in just seconds. At liftoff, the vehicle produces 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust and lofts the vehicle weighing nearly 6 million pounds and standing 32 stories tall to orbit. Propelled by a pair of five segment boosters and four liquid engines, the rocket achieves maximum dynamic pressure only 90 seconds into the mission, a period of greatest atmospheric force on the structure of the rocket. 
thousands will gather in Florida to watch our ship get smaller and smaller and leave the Space Coast behind. Approximately two minutes into the mission, the boosters will have consumed all of their solid propellant and are safely jettisoned. The rocket will continue on, guiding itself to orbit with magnificent precision. Just three minutes into the mission, the service module fairings are jettisoned to lighten the vehicle and expose Orion's solar arrays. Just 40 seconds later, the launch abort system is also jettisoned. It is no longer needed. Orion can safely abort at any time. Once at the desired velocity target, the core stage engines are shut down and the core stage separates. The interim cryopropulsion stage with Orion will continue to orbit the Earth. Along the way, it will pass through the altitude of the International Space Station at 250 statute miles. During this first orbit, the solar rays are deployed so that Orion no longer needs battery power. It can now produce its own power. Following solar array deployment, the arrays are positioned into a load bearing configuration to prepare for the perigee rays maneuver. The rays maneuver will ensure an Earth orbit and use the thrust provided by the interim prow propulsion stage. Once the perigee rays maneuver is complete, Orion systems are checked prior to committing to the translunar injection or TLI maneuver. The TLI maneuver must be successfully completed to depart Earth orbit. The TLI burn is approximately 20 minutes in duration and increases the spacecraft's velocity over 9,000 feet per second, a speed change faster than a high-powered rifle bullet travels. Following TLI, Orion is committed to a lunar trajectory just one and a half hours after launch. Once complete, the spacecraft adapter will remain with the interim crowd propulsion stage and they will separate from Orion. As Orion departs low Earth orbit, it will fly through the orbital debris field encircling the Earth, past the global positioning navigation satellites, past the communication satellites in geostationary orbit, and through the Van Allen radiation belts, on into the deep space radiation environment. Orion is now entering an outbound coast space. The spacecraft is uniquely designed to navigate, communicate, and operate in this deep space environment. The outbound coast of the moon will take approximately four days. As Orion approaches the moon, the service module will be used to perform a critical lunar gravity assist maneuver, allowing the ship to enter a distant retrograde orbit about the moon. The moon will get larger and larger in the window, and in closest approach, Orion will be just 62 miles from the surface of the moon. As the spacecraft flies around the far side of the moon, we will lose all communication back on Earth, and for a period of time, Orion will be on its own. Mission Control will await acquisition of signal, and as we lock on, the new generation will see their first Earth rise. The spacecraft is now in the distant retrograde orbit, where its systems will be tested in the deep space environment for over a week. Along the way, our ship will travel farther from Earth than any human-capable spacecraft has ever gone. At the farthest point, Orion will be some 1,000 times farther from Earth than the International Space Station, at over 270,000 miles away. Teams in Mission Control Houston and at Naval Base San Diego will prepare for Orion's return home, and the recovery ship will set sail for the recovery zone in the Pacific Ocean. Orion will exit the distant retrograde orbit with another lunar gravity assist and service module engine fire. Along the way, the trajectory will be adjusted to target the Earth's thin atmosphere at over a quarter million miles away and ensure precision landing the Pacific Ocean following a direct entry. During the coast home, Orion will maintain the desire to tail the sun attitude to optimize spacecraft cooling and maximize power production in the deep space environment. Another four days return coast home to Earth. As our home planet fills the windows of Orion, an important contribution from our European partners called the Service Module has done its job. The Service Module is jettisoned separates. Following separation, the world's largest heat shield will be oriented into the direction of travel to prepare for entry interface at an altitude of 400,000 feet. At entry interface, Orion will hit the Earth's atmosphere traveling at a speed of 24,500 miles an hour and decelerate it up to nine times the force of gravity. The heat shield will protect the spacecraft from temperatures half as hot as the surface of the sun approaching 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Orion will continue to decelerate 
pass through the sound barrier and announce its arrival to the waiting recovery team with a sign boom. Following peak heating, a protective thermal cover that sits over the parachutes will be jettisoned. This begins a series of parachute deployments. The drogue chute deployment series is designed to stabilize and slow the spacecraft, and in a period of less than 20 minutes, Orion will slow from a speed of Mach 32 to zero and splash down. The three main parachutes will deploy and slowly unfurl and suspend the 22,000 pound capsule and allow it to gently descend to the surface of the ocean. So when does that happen? Yeah, that happens in 2020. Uh, early 2020, I think it was April, and uh, it's been set back a few years because it was meant to go up uh, this year, next year, the year after. So uh, that's the current American um, rocket that will take us to the moon and beyond. However not one bit of that other than the command module that's actually uh, reusable. The solid rockets aren't reused, the engines are not reused, the core's not reused, and most organisations at the moment are, are really working on reusability. Okay, that's it. I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that because I've gone over time. That's rebooting. Angelo, the um, shuttle boosters were Recovered. Yes, but the SLSs are not. No, they're five. These these five boosters, segment, yeah. these boosters are actually five segment. The shuttle pumps were four. <coughs> they don't recover these and reuse them. Mind you, they'd probably be lucky to launch two of these SLSs a year if they're lucky. <coughs> and so, why would you want to reuse the boosters? It probably cost you more to refurbish them to just throw them into the ocean. So that's the theory behind it. The real issue with the SLS is the fact that uh, there's probably another $10 billion to spend on the thing, and that's the big issue. The whole development of the Orion um, and SLS system seems to be in the order of $40 billion in total. Now, when you look at SpaceX, you look at what he said the other day about the development of Falcon Heavy. Uh, he said it was over 500,000. Uh, 500 million. So if you add, let's make it a million dollars. We know that the Falcon 9 took probably, uh, sorry, a billion dollars to develop, plus another billion. So let's say two and a half billion dollars to develop the Falcon Heavy. Uh, this thing is going to cost 40 billion dollars. People are criticizing it as job for the boys. Go and market it. And then, I've sort of seen a few reports lately, you know, articles doing the comparisons, mm. and they're baselining SLS from when SLS was approved, totally forgetting all the money that was spent on RE's. Constellation spent ten billion dollars yeah. and got nowhere. I just want to oh, sorry, just on boosters. It got one flight, but it also did uh, start the process of the SLS, and it certainly was a continuation of the Orion, and con it continued into Orion. But, but, but they spent 10 million dollars. The development of the booster, though, yeah, yeah it just came straight out of the development of Ares, <coughs> and that was fast track because it was just reusing shuttle technology. Now, if you look at the entire development cycle of all that, and the money that's been spent on all of that. Yeah, the, the argument goes like this. The governments, the private sector can do this stuff for you know, a tenth of the cost that the, that the governments can do it. However, the government will argue that, um, first off, NASA gave SpaceX a lot of help. There's no doubt about that. But not as much as was originally requested in every, every budget. Correct. And, and the same with... Um, Correct. And, and the other thing is, they will also argue they're not as reliable. Look at the Atlas. Look at the history of the reliability of the Atlas rocket, the, the Deltas. You know, I mean, yeah. Falcons have failed twice. Yeah, but look at their reliability in their first 10 years of service. The question then arises is, where's the balance? Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I was a real firm supporter of the SLS. I still have a firm supporter of Orion, but I reckon that we could buy a lot more Falcon Heavies and accomplish a lot more missions and do more things and have NASA spend its money uh, more effectively than to throw its money into the SLS. The problem is it's job for the boys. The SLS uh, 
was shuttle derived simply to allow all the big uh, aerospace companies. It's, it's jobs for the boys in certain electoral college states. Oh, That's the bottom line. Yeah. I didn't want to go that far. You're probably right. Though. Yeah, and girls. Jobs for girls. <laughs> um, another question. Um, what happened to Musk's man flight around the moon? That's on hold. And the reason why it's on hold is because that Elon Musk was going to man rate the Falcon Heavy. Okay, they dropped that. Why? Because they're building the VFR. Now, how far away is it? Well, next year you're going to start to see VFR bits come out of the factories. They are dead set that they'll stop building Falcon 9s that create Falcon Heavies, and they're going straight for the VFR. So the next couple of years, the idea is that the passengers who were allegedly paid you know, whatever, some, 100 million, whatever, for a trip around the moon, they will go in a VFR. But the, he hasn't yet got his engine affected. No, he hasn't, but he's, uh, he's working it's through it. It's methane, isn't it? It's, uh, it is methane, it's the, uh, no, it's and you don't the Raptor, it. yeah, the Raptor engine. You don't hear anything about it. You don't, but you don't hear that much about the V4 from the Origin either. You do see a little bit in it, but not, not a lot. So you'll find that Elon is quietly, quietly, getting on with the job. I think what we'll find is that the the, the fact that the Falcon Heavy was delayed three years, five, five years, five years okay. Okay. Um, I think we'll find that the engineering required for the BFR is substantially, even more substantially harder than the engineering for the Falcon Heavy. So I don't, I'm not too sure we're going to see BFR in the oh. next five, six, seven years. Okay. Well, let's assume that, uh, I mean, he was talking of launching to Mars in 2022. Let's assume he's out by five years. 2028, NASA hasn't got to the moon yet, and he may actually get something on the Mars. So don't underestimate what he can do. Oh, I, I never underestimate him, but he also tends to, um, what's he call them, provide um, objectives that are stretching. He, but because of, one of the problems with BFR is where you launch it because it's too noisy for the cake. Is that right? I hadn't heard The that energy that it's going to produce is probably too noisy for the cake. Well, you do know that the, the West Texas site, uh, the East Texas site, sorry, is now starting to ramp up. They fixed up the, uh, I think it's uh, Space Launch Complex 41, and now they're focusing on the West Texas. I suspect he's going to be doing tests of the VFR in West Texas. And and that's isolated out there. There's nothing nothing around for miles. Oh, you can't say that. You got in trouble for saying there's nothing out there. And then all the residents went, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the six of them. Hey, it's got <laughs> the cave. The cave's got houses right around it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and the six that wouldn't sell. Yeah. <laughs> A lot have already sold. Yeah. Look, uh, what's tending to happen is that the uh, the government programs, the Russian, uh, the Chinese to some extent, they're, the, uh, they're sort of ramping up, but all the government agencies are kind of stagnant, not, not really doing much with their budgets. And further, they're not getting bang for bucks, whilst the commercial space is, you know, what people are calling the space renaissance, for want of a better, better word. So, there's a lot happening, and uh, NASA did spur it on, you know, Obama in 2010, uh, which Bush had started beforehand about commercialising space, seems to have been, uh, it may pay off, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll be the beneficiaries of it, I hope. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That was great. Well, thanks, uh, Andrew. Angelo, uh, Happens a lot of work into these each month, and uh, we also do a weekly um, segment on the radio show, which uh, Angelo and Mike Labilla are involved with. So uh, um, it's a lot of fun, and if you can tune in, it's uh, it's eighty eight point three something. Yeah. So now we're going to hand over to uh, Len Halpin. Len has been a long time member of the association, and uh, I think they're part of the group. And um, he had a recent trip to the US, and I'm just going to hand straight over to Len. And, Okay, for those that don't know me, I'm Len Halperin, and I'm standing in front of the screen. Uh, 
I mentioned to the guys back in November, December that I would be travelling over to the States in December, January because as a teacher it's the only time I can really travel. I said it was basically for family R&R, &R, but I thought I'd throw in a few places along the way. So what I did, took my wife and son, and we did a trip through the US, mainly up and down the East Coast, but we also deviated to Denver because we wanted to catch up with some friends, we had families, so we did all of that. And what I wanted to do with this trip was, um, it was winter, we know it's the price you pay for travelling when it's very cold, so my wife said, I've never been to Florida, and I thought, aha, uh -huh. okay, hey. let's go to Florida. I've, I've been there previously, so we will do that. And um, I also thought, we are going to other places, and this is more about, if you go to somewhere in the US and you have an interest in space, no matter where you go, if you do a bit of pre-research, you can usually find some sort of connection in most places to the space program if you're interested. Some of them are a bit obtuse, and in a couple of occasions here, I put my tongue in my cheek and I draw a little bit of a long bow, but go with me, there's space in all of these things somewhere. So um, what we did, we actually arrived first of all in New York, which sounds a bit weird, but when we checked on using our frequent flyer points, the only way we could get in was direct was to go via Asia to New York. So we did that. So that was our entry point. And of course, for those of you that don't know much about New York, there is the old Intrepid aircraft carrier parked permanently in the Hudson River, and it's got a whole lot of aeroplanes on there. And I'm not a great aeroplane fan, but how often do you get to see an aircraft carrier? But the Space Link here, and many of you will know, that they've got one of the flight test shuttle orbiters. They've got the... Um, Enterprise. Which one? Enterprise. The Enterprise, that's right. See, I lost track there. The Enterprise. There are six orbiters all together. We managed to end up seeing two of them. Two of them are destroyed, so there are only two other ones. Uh, so if you have a look at this thing, this is moored at about, I think, 50th Street in the Hudson River. And I was talking to the guys there. They actually had to remove the propellers off it to get it into position because they were lodging in the mud. They had to do a bit of dredging, they had to remove the propellers. So this thing is now there permanently. It's a pretty old aircraft carrier and it did see a lot of action and there were kamikaze attacks on it during the Second World War and it survived. Um, but some of the sailors didn't. So you, you better go over onto this side, I guess. Uh, maybe that, maybe that doesn't work. Okay. So I want to go through these things pretty quickly. So on board, there's the SR-71. There's all of other airplanes. I've got photos of most of them. This was just a sample of what's on board. So you keep going and you get to walk. Can you check with the Apollo 11? Uh, I don't think Intrepid did a recover Apollo 11. No. They can't get a recovery of Apollo 11. I thought, 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 I
This is the rear of the concourse looking forwards, and that's the wheel, because it, otherwise it's bum scraped the wrong way. That's a wheel at the back of the concourse. All right, okay, yep. Yeah. Keep going. And yeah, just another photo of the Intrepid there. Now, after New York, we moved on to Rhode Island. I wanted to see, we wanted to see some folks around the Providence and Newport area. And then we were moving to Boston when my wife had some family. And I thought, going from Providence to Boston is a couple of hours up the road, but I thought I would take a scenic route. And this is the first instance of what I say about doing a little bit of research you can actually discover some things along the way. And I went a little bit inland from the direct coastal route between Providence and Boston. Another shot of that. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping a few slides. Oh, we visited a third world country yet again to align for food. No, this is the storm that hit the northeast while we were there. It was um, called Winter Storm Grayson. And it was the worst that New York had seen in a century, and the temperatures there were about 25 below each day without the wind chill. And they reckon exposure outside for more than 10 minutes was dangerous. We were standing outside the Museum of Natural History because it was our last day there, thinking, what else can we do? Let's go have a look at oh, the entrance there. Oh, our senses, yeah, be out of your senses to stand there. Yeah. Just quickly, the interpret two yeah. missions. Uh, Scott Carpenter, the Royal yes, Seven, Scott, yes. and Gemini Three, John Young, and Chris. Yeah, it was a long way from Scott Carpenter. And this is inside the uh, Museum of Natural History, which is the one supposedly in that uh, movie night at the museum. This is the ground floor of the Hayden Planetarium with a space display and a whole lot of excellent exhibits down there and a curved walkway that goes from the lower level to the upper level. And I'll show you in another slide. The curved walkway has got a timeline from the creation of the um, universe up to the modern day in billions of years, so it's really good. So when I'm at the top level, the planetarium itself is a giant sphere architecturally built inside a giant enclosure. So you walk across this area to go into the planetosphere, into the um, yeah, into the planetarium. We were not allowed to do photography in there. I was so desperately wanted to take a photo in there. It was very, very good. So that is the Hayden Planetarium, home of that famous astronomical publicizer. Neil deGrasse Yeah. NDT. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, and I love Rexy. You've got to have a photo of Rexy. <laughs> so and what kids don't like space and dinosaurs, really? So now we move on, and I'm doing my research between Boston, between Providence and Boston. You've got to go inland a bit, and you all know that photo. That's a pretty famous photo. So I went to this place, and this was just after the storm had passed, and it's at the Pacachale Golf Club. And I had spoken. I'd actually done some research with our friend Jim Hansen. I'd stayed in touch with Jim. And I asked him if he'd been out there, and he said, yeah, you will have no problem flying it, it's on the ninth fairway. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, well, it was about, you know, in 18 inches in the old money full of snow, and I thought, I'm not tracing out to the ninth fairway. Well, I couldn't if I wanted to. I would have needed, you know, a dog team to get out there. So um, they do acknowledge, though, that it's on the, oh, I'll go back a bit, oh, on that sign there, the National Historic Register, they've got that, a, a drawing of the um, Goddard photo. But this is, that's the clubhouse of the, Patrick Choe Golf Club. So I keep going. Patrick Choe, there, there you go. And somewhere out on the ninth fairway <laughs> is the site where Goddard launched the world's first liquid fuel rocket. Again, had it been summer, we would have gone to the site. There is a little stone there, there's a marker there, there's a plaque there. And this just shows you in obscure places you can find space history. The golf course closed. That was the only thing that I found. And that, that's the clubhouse. Yeah, well, that, that's out of order. That should be the last slide. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're way out of order now. The slides are all out of order. So. Okay, quickly. Just sort it into name order. Yeah, it was in. I hit the wrong button. Okay. Yeah, I had to rename them to put them in the right order. This is all jumped out. That was our last day in Los Angeles, just walking down the street. It gives the always the homeless person, and he just had a cold for summer. Not homeless. Yeah, we've seen that one. It's the back of the star. Yeah, no, sorry. We've selected a whole lot of things. Don't push to leave. No, no, I'm not going there. Good. Any technical issues there?
And all along the way, I was able to, in many places, find something that either had a link or an obscure sort of drawing along bow link to space. Yeah, we're going to go through them while we're back in New York. Yeah, this is a test. It's a test. Okay, yeah, so keep going. Okay, in Boston, obscure link, this is the only USS Constitution class vessel that I saw on my trip. It's the original USS Constitution. Very obscure space link there, but uh, yeah, old Ironsides. Uh, it's, it's still a commissioned Navy vessel in the US. It's the first vessel in the US Navy, and um, apparently cadets get their not wings, whatever cadets get when they graduate, they have ceremonies on board there. It was made of such heavy wood that when the British were firing cannon at it back then, they sort of just bounced off, so they gave the nickname Old Ironsides. Uh, we've now moved to Vail in Colorado, and Vail is a really cute little ski resort. We didn't ski, we were sightseeing, we're on a very tight schedule. And um, just noticed this guy sitting there, I thought I'd have a photo with him. From Vail, we jumped again to Boulder, Colorado, and Boulder is a bit of a bohemian sort of town. It's a really nice area. It's about an hour's drive out of Denver. Uh, we, we had some good friends that we were staying with in Denver. And there was this sort of like bohemian souvenir shop. It was like a bohemians meet National Geographic science shop. And this guy claimed that this was the oldest meteorite in the world. It was 4.3 billion years old. And I do believe that it is an iron, iron class meteorite, but I challenged him on the fact that it was 4.3 billion years old. Any quick research will show that the oldest one we have on the Earth is nowhere near that age, but I didn't want to ruin his day too much. But there you are, a meteorite in a souvenir shop now, just pause there. Also in Boulder, Colorado, at 1619 Pine Avenue, uh, Boulder, Colorado, is this house. Does anyone recognize it? Very, very obscure space link. We're really stretching the uh, obscure here. Morley Brown. Yeah, more. Yeah, it's more and Mindy's house. Yeah, there are probably people here that have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, next. And then I actually did some real serious research because it's a story about who lived at the corner of 7th and Aurora. And so there were four houses there and my wife said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to knock on the door and talk to people. She said, no, you're not. And I said, watch me. And so uh, this, this house looked like a good candidate to me on the corner of 7th and Aurora in Boulder, Colorado. Next. Getting closer to the house. Next. And next, yep, on there. Um, so they gave the shop. Ah, oh, oh, so got a of yeah. So if you go up to the next one, you're about to see the plaque. And so I knocked on the door. Now in America, you're on the risk of somebody coming with a shotgun, but now nah, it was a, a lovely lady. And I said, look, I'm a space history buff from Australia, passing through town. I did a bit of research. I was going to ask you if this is the house, but clearly from the plaque it is. Is there anything you want to add? Did you ever come by here? And she was very friendly, very welcoming, and she said, actually, a few years ago, just before he passed on, he did come and he spent about half an hour here. And he's not convinced, and she's not convinced what it says on the plaque about the link between 7th and Aurora and him being Aurora 7. But the story goes that that's where he got the name from. But he, you know, Carpenter didn't confirm or deny it and she's not convinced one way or the other, so that's an open history question there. They could rename the street. But they could rename the street and then they have to rename the space mission, yes. So anyway, that was Scott Carpenter's out. Next one, another very obscure space reference. You've got to be really good on this one. It's in Denver. We're back in Denver, drove from Boulder back to Denver. This lady, very, very obscure. Yes, slow down, slow down. Any, any, any bits at all? Very obscure. This one's Molly, Molly Brown, very good. Oh, the real name. The real name is actually, actually Margaret Brown. A uh, Denver socialite got rich in the social boom and, and the silver boom of the late 1890s made squillions. She became most famous for being a survivor of the Titanic, as in the Titanic. She wasn't able to survive it to, to rescue either Kate Winslet or Leonardo DiCaprio, but she survived. And she was a really tough lady. She went on to do lots of great things. Molly Brown, keep going. That's the Molly Brown House in Denver. We toured through that. And the space link, of course, is because she was the unsinkable Molly Brown. Gemini 3. Gemini 3. Intrepid. Intrepid. Correct. Gemini 3 was nicknamed um, the unsinkable Molly Brown by Grissom. 
and NASA was furious, and they said, you'll shop on name any more space vehicles until Apollo 9, which was when they start getting names again, Spider and Gumdrop. We've now moved to Florida. How, how did you go from New York to Colorado? Florida. Why did you go that direction? Because we had friends that we wanted to see in Denver. Okay. And if we've come all the way from Melbourne, then we didn't think New York to Denver was a really big deal. Yeah. Ended up being up. Denver is a hub, and we ended up having to go through Chicago anyway. That's another story. So we're now down in Florida. I've cut out the Orlando bit where you do the theme parks, and uh, that was really nice. But I've done that before, but my family hadn't. And this is the Rocket Park. This is at the Visitor Center. I've got to say, the Visitor Center itself, for those that haven't been, you absolutely have to see it. If you have been there, I think it's more child oriented than adult oriented in a lot of ways. I see this having a lot of educated value because I'm a teacher. But I think there's more value in the tours that they offer, especially if you're more into the history of the place. And they offer a great set of tours. And I booked up for as many of them as we could and we were only there for two days. And the one secret is if you're going to go there, it is worth spending two days and not one day. One day is expensive. Two days, if you buy the annual pass, is cheaper than twice lots of one day. And you get free parking as well if you buy the annual pass, which we did. And you get on the priority, priority list for other things. Inside is an Orion. This thing's on a stand that rotates. So there's a real Orion. And you do get a sense when you walk past it that it is really bigger than Apollo. But you still think it could have been so much bigger. It, it's reasonably big. That's a pretty tall thing there. Um, you can see by the handrail if that's the waist height of a person, but that is a pretty tall thing. But anyway, so that's on display there. Next, uh, we had to do that. So the astronaut we hooked up with was uh, the first Brazilian astronaut. Does anybody know the name of the first Brazilian astronaut? No, it's not Carmen Miranda, no. Uh, people wouldn't know who that was either. Uh, Marcus Pontus. And he ended up going to the International Space Station, going up on a Soyuz TMA-8 to replace Anasay Ansari, and came down on a Soyuz TMA-7 about nine days later. So he was the ferry person. So they, they always had two people going up to stay, and one person going up on, oh no, so two people going up and down, and one person going up and coming back. So next, uh, yeah, that's the, the front entrance to the park, and they've got a uh, shuttle main, in, main tank and two solid boosters at the back there, which is the entry to the Atlantis oh. display. Now, that's, that is the famous Apollo clock. It was only retired in 2014 and moved from its location at Launch Pad 39. It's, it was just in the visitor's complex for Launch Pad 39. They relocated it to the, um, to the visitor's center, which is several miles away. And they've got this new super duper clock down there at the yard. That was at the best site. That was uh, the press site. Yeah, that was at the press site. That's the one that's in all the photos of yeah. all the Apollo launches. Yeah. And it now sits in front, since 2014, it sits in front of the visitor center. Yeah. And the digits worked. It was counting down something. There was a launch imminent of, of a vehicle. Anyway, keep going. Uh, that's the Mercury Control inside the Heroes and Legends display, which has more of the history buff, it's more interesting to me. Uh, Mercury Control, keep going. Uh, yeah, there's a, Ge there's a, uh, a Gemini capsule. Yeah, so. Next. And there was, this was only a week or two after John Young had passed away, and there was a tribute inside the Heroes of Legends display. Next. And keep going through this. Um, yeah, the Mercury 7, the Mercury 8. Mercury 8, yeah. Yeah. I love that engine. Oh, yeah. Those were the days when they really got rocket engines. Yeah. Keep going. Serious engines. Yeah, and that's the entry to the Atlantis display. Now, I bit my tongue, it was against my religion to have anything to do with a shuttle, but I went in there anyway to show my family around. And the technology in there was really impressive. There's more infrastructure supporting this thing on a really sexy diagonal angle than probably in the shuttle itself. The way they mounted it, I have to say, is very impressive. And you can walk around it on multiple levels. There's an upper level, a lower level. And um, I'm just thinking of the loads and strains on the mounts they used to mount it at this angle. So keep going. Yeah, you can see inside the cargo bay. It always impresses me as a space person from a little country that doesn't have a space program how clever the Canadians were. It's the one thing that strikes me about the orbiter, that Canada arm is just absolutely brilliant. 
such a simple device with a big word Canada on it. And they're the same size as us um, economically, um, uh, population wise, all sorts of things. We are equivalent to a Canada. That's what they did. Yeah, I thought that was clever. I mean, I'm still not a big fan of the vehicle that set us back 40 years, but that's another story. Uh, that's the engines at the back, keep going. And again, at the Rocket Park, I think that's one of my HDR shots, high, high dynamic range photos, where I sort of did a bit of processing on that. Now, we had been there, we had been locked into a two day schedule to go there, and um, I noticed on the calendar there was going to be a launch of an Atlas V. So I got online and I've got tickets, and I was too late to get to the prime viewing site, which was at the LC39 complex, but we're back at the Apollo Saturn V complex, which is about, that's the second closest distance you can get. So it's night time, we got on board the bus, and just pause for a moment. Uh, we got out there and I said to my wife, the Atlas V is an incredibly reliable vehicle. We sat out there and it was winter in Florida on the coast. We were freezing, but we were really wrapped up and prepared for it. And at T minus 40 on this Atlas V flight to launch a USAF Sibbers 4 satellite, that's the space-based infrared surveillance system. It's part of the global system that monitors any launch of any object anywhere in the world from random places such as, say, North Korea. Yeah, and um, so that was going to be the launch of the super satellite. And at T minus 40, there was an announcement that it's been scrubbed because there was some problem with the fuel valve in the first stage. This is the Atlas V, and I looked it up. 75 launches, and only one failure. So anyway. I said to my wife, this thing is too good, they'll probably have another go, let's just wait and see what happens. So um, they announced they're going to reschedule for the other night. And we've been talking to folks around it. People come up just for the day and they claim the whole day around it. And I thought, 90% of these people are not coming back. So I got straight online again and got tickets for the next night, which was our second night there. And we got to the prime viewing site, which was only three kilometres from the water site. Now on our second day of driving back from Cocoa Beach to, to the visitor centre, I pulled over on the side of the road, and my wife and son said, what are you doing? I said, I'm obliged to take photos of this building. I promised to people back in Melbourne. So this is right behind the visitor centre. It's only a kilometre or two, less than a kilometre from the visitor centre. Drove past it, pulled up. What would you do if you were in one of these windows and you looked down and saw a car pull over to the side of the road and a window go down and a camera poke out? So that was me. I did that. I did not dare go in there. I didn't. It's still under construction. So this is the Jeff Bezos building. It's right behind the visitor center of the Cape. So these photos were taken about January 19. Yeah, January the 19th. So only, only a month ago. And as you can see, it's still under construction. They're all the construction signs. And there's a lot of land out the back of it. Keep going, there are a few of these. That's all fenced off. There's another little building out the back there. But clearly, it's a very well advanced facility now. I mean, we were talking about construction phases only last year or something. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff there now. This is a little bit more up to date than Google Earth. It was uh, it was handed over about Christmas time. The first part of it wasn't all completed actually. No, no. Well, I can still see there was construction going on there, yeah. and that was, I said, January 19. Yeah. So just in front of the visitor centre is a Mercury Redstone with a Mercury on top of it. Uh, one of the tours we did was the old NASA behind the scenes tour, and that was that's their original um, uh, control center, not control center, their original head office at the Cape. This is NASA's head office at the Cape, and it's been decommissioned and replaced by, go to the next one, this is their new building, that's going to be NASA's new headquarters at the Cape. It's got eight levels named for each of the planets. Actually, seven levels. Earth is the ground level, and each of the other levels is going to be named after one of the planets. This building was there telling us to come out. No, we didn't. That's, no, 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 that's no. not true. No, it's out of drive. It's now, it's now out at Armstrong. Armstrong. Yeah, yeah Armstrong Drive. Yeah. So also, just behind the vehicle assembly building is this shed. It's got the Boeing logo on one side of it. Keep going. And also, there's the tower that they were working on. Now, when this started live under Aries, this was um, um, a Bush Obama tower, Obama candidate. So that's when it got converted to, we've now got to upgrade this tower for SLS. But for EM1, it's almost been, it has been upgraded. For EM2, it's got to be extended, got to go higher. I couldn't detect a lean as our bus went past. Oh, they the reckon it's twisted? Right. I got, I got my little laser out, I did a quick calculation. I on it's, a, it's a ruse, that's where yeah. you want to get another one built. Probably. So that's the other side of the Boeing factory, and that's the VA. Oh no, 
I'll get a better shot of the VAB in a second. That's the CS. Oh, that's the X37B. There's the VAB, the black thing that oh. covers the window of the bus. And there's one of the two crawlers back from Apollo days. What was that called? Cool that is the current status of the launch. It looks like it's leaning there, doesn't it? They had names, Ants and Fritz or something. Probably. Yeah, yeah. B1 and B2. Yeah, yeah. So, and that is the launch control center for launch pad 39, where all the Apollos, Skylabs, and shuttles for launch. Well, they've changed at least their bay. Yeah, so keep going. Uh, now, this is 39B. Now, the main, it's undergoing refurbishment. The main difference from the Apollo days is the four lightning arrested towers. Now, the, the guy claimed that they were about 600 feet tall. They're certainly taller than a rocket. I'm not sure about 600 feet, but they're, they're certainly way taller than a rocket. Apparently, Florida is the lightning capital of the US, and the Cape Canaveral area is the lightning capital of Florida. They have more strikes there than anywhere else. So all their launch pads now have these lightning arresters. I wonder what Alan Bean thinks about that. <laughs> so that's the flame trench from 39B. And there is, yeah, can, can you see the Tesla in there? I'll mark it red so you know there. There was a Tesla in there. So that was from about oh, less than a kilometre, several hundred metres away. Okay, and that there's a site on the coast between 39A and 39B. So that's 39A. Over there, yep, that's 39A in the background. And they've got this thing here showing the patches of all the missions were launched from 39A and 39B. Only one Apollo was launched from 39B. 10. 10, very good. Next, flame trench, uh, the lightning towers. Yep. So that's the ramp up to 39B. These are the flame detector deflectors. They're being refurbished. Apparently, they have the surfaces have to be, com be completely refurbished, and they're working on those to be reinstalled in the flame trench. So that work is ongoing. There's the VAB. They give you all the stats on the flag. That the field of stars is the size of a basketball court, and each of the stripes is the width of a road. You can drive a bus up and down, and each of the stars is six foot across. So, and that's the biggest NASA meatball in the world. There is an Orion escape tower. You see how that flag looks like it's upside down? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. If you have, if you have a horizontal and it strikes horizontal. Correct. It looks correct right? from the inside of the building looking out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's uh, an Orion escape tower next. Uh, there's an old um, uh, Apollo launch tower gantry. Really? Next. Uh, but you see the hole where it's missing your bolt? Is that the shadow one? I'll make a claim that it's an Apollo one. But anyway, keep going. And then I was able to get the bus actually went past that door. I was able to get a good shot of that side of the Boeing building. For those buildings are where the shuttle orbit was usually. Yeah, they used to be the shuttle orbit or refurbishment buildings. There's, there's one for Boeing, there's an X 37. Yes. Uh, that you had a picture of before. Oh, I've shown that photo already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we did go past the X 37 B1. Yeah, yeah. 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 the other one. The other one is for. Keep going. Nobody told me. Oh, yeah, and along the way you do see alligators. Now, this is at the Saturn V, uh, just behind the VAB, about two minutes behind the VAB on the bus tour. It drops you off at the Saturn V Center. When I first went 30 years ago, their Saturn V, their horizontal Saturn V, was out in the open and it was weathering badly and it took a lot to refurbish it and maintain it. So they relocated it to the other side of the VAB. And they built an enormous shed around it with a lot of displays and concession stands and everything. I have to say, it's really impressive. This is that's the one thing to me, subjective. I thought that was worth seeing. Keep going. If there's one thing you want to see, man, at the yeah. cave, it's that. Yeah. I think that's everyone that should see that. Beautifully displayed. Houston is really ordinary. Yeah, that is brilliant. Yeah, the Houston shed doesn't look very nice, but the way they've done it there, it looks really, really good. That is excellent. Yeah. So we then did the um, launch control center tour. And uh, that's my son and I. Uh, that's old Apollo age equipment. That's a direct, NASA director stand. I love the um, switches on the computer there for bootloading things. You have to manually load the bootloader and things like that. Keep going. Uh, yeah, but if you need to be good in programming in Octal. Is that, is that an old iPhone, is it? 
get a small life back. Uh, this is inside Launch Control Centre 4. The building has four Launch Control Centres. This is an active one. It's been completely refurbished since the Apollo days. This launched a whole lot of shuttle flights. But the way they restructured it, you can all see those photos of rows and rows of console, consoles. It's slightly different now. They've still got the glass window there looking in, and the main director consoles are over here. There's one row there and one row there. They're the windows looking out towards the pads towards 39A and 39B. So um, you've got these rows of consoles there facing the other way. You'll see what happens if I've got a photo the other way. That's looking out the windows, looking straight down the hallway towards um, the pads. You can see the SpaceX building there. And um, there it is, oh, there's the Tesla room there. You can see it. There it is, that's the Falcon Heavy sitting on the pad. Now what they've done here in the main floor area where the rows of consoles used to be, these are contractor areas and they come in according to the launch requirements, depending on what's being launched. They are contractor cells, and contractors just move in there for the period of whatever it is that's being launched from this control centre. Uh, yep, launch director. Yep, keep going. Uh, I took a photo of this because should this lady, whose name I, they told me and I've forgotten, and somebody might know it, and I forgot to Google it before I came here, she is going to become, if she hasn't already, but this was in January, the first launch director, first female launch director, as in she's in control of the whole show. So she's been a faithful servant and she's been promoted. And you'll have to Google her name. I always like taking photos of signs like that. Yeah, and that's outside, right outside the front door of the launch control center, looking back at the VAB. You get no idea of the scale of it. And there's another shot of the work on the launch tower. They were really getting excited about this, saying it's nearly ready, it's nearly ready, the work is going really well on this. That was the message that we were getting there. I'm trying to take photos from a moving object. Um, yep, keep going. Now, one of the displays at the Saturn V display is that when the bus drops you off, you've got that um, marvel of why Americans do this, they've learned a lot from Disneyland. They drop you off at a door that takes you through a display before you get to what you came to see, which is the Saturn V. This display is a full fair income recreation well, it is the Apollo 8 launch room, the launch control room of Apollo 8, and they play the movie of the, launch, the last two or three minutes of the launch of Apollo 8, with all the consoles lighting up and doing various things. That is the Apollo 8 launch control room. Yeah, so there you go. This is the rear of the thing. I love it. Just love it. This is how you make a rocket. Elon, take note. This is a little rocket. Did it hit you in the face when you opened the door? Oh, yeah. Oh, shit, yeah. It was amazing. SH1T, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Keep going. Uh, yep, there's a row of all the Apollo emblems there. That's the Apollo 17 command module. It's in, in part of the displays. There's a range of displays in little pavilions around the edge of the main Saturn V display. What does it say? I believe. I thought it was 14. That's 14. Oh, you could be right. 17. 17. 17. 17. 17. Yeah, 14. 17. Yeah. yeah. My bad. Keep going. Yeah, the Apollo 14 command module. Mm. The first completely extended Apollo crew. Very sad. I uh, just love the command service module. Mm. Uh, they're in the, they've got another Apollo walkway there. They've got a really good memorial to the Apollo 1 guys. You walk through this archway where they've got vapor. I don't know whether it's water vapor or CO2. And they project the Apollo 1 emblem onto this vapor. And it, it looks, it's very ethereal. It looks really impressive. So they've actually acknowledged these guys. Over in the Atlantis exhibit, they've got a full memoriam to the two to the two shuttle flights. So here, yeah, there's the command and service module, and there's my attempt at a full-length shot. That's one of my HDR shots. Uh, we're back at the visitor center as a Saturn 1B, and no, that's my HDR shot because it's sunset of all the rockets. We're now queuing up for our second attempt to go to the launch, to go to the launch of the Saturn V, not Saturn V, I wish. Yeah, yeah. Freudian, Freudian, <laughs> an Atlas V. Oh, I think it should be about an Atlas V. It's bigger than anything I launched out of the milk bottle. Uh, for those of you, I'll explain later what a milk bottle is. It's leaning, see? It is leaning, yeah. Now, that is the, um, that's 
that is our rock. And I have it, the best lens I have with me was my GB 250 mil lens. We're about three kilometres away, that's the Atlas V. That tower is the... That is, I was able to get a better shot, because I only had to turn around 90 degrees and I was facing 39A. That's my shot of, a nighttime shot of the Falcon Heavy, which was due to go about two weeks after we were there. Yeah, another shot of the Falcon Heavy, and that's our, that's our shot. If you go through these, now actually before you do, the guy, there was about oh, a couple of hundred of us there at the prime, I oh, believe you've been to that site, the, the prime viewing area, it's halfway down the crawlway, it's almost before you get to 39A. And um, he said, now look, I know what you're going to do when the launch comes. You are all going to point all your devices there, your phones, you're going to take movies, you're going to point your cameras, and everything. Let me tell you something. I'm going to suggest to you, you put everything down and just enjoy it because you have to take it in. It's going to be a roar of sound. It's all going to be over in seconds and you're going to go like this. But I know that that's going to fall on deaf ears and you're going to take photos anyway. But if I were you, what I would do is put all your devices down because you can always go online the next day onto YouTube and get a really good video of the launch. So I thought, you know what, the guy's right. But anyway, I set my camera up and I just held it there and I had it on you know, multi-frame. I was going click, 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 click. But I watched it. I took his advice and that paid off because you really have to experience this thing visually. It's no good looking at it on a little screen or through a viewfinder. So I managed to get about three or four shots off. This is the launch of the Atlas V with um, the Cibers 4 satellite on board for the United States Air Force. So keep going. You can see the camera's moving, but I was able to sort of get it. Yeah. And being night time, you're able to follow it for a long way. Now, really obscure space reference here. To any red-blooded young man growing up as a teenager in the 60s, and, and we had astronauts and we had girls in pink bikinis. I apologise to the inappropriateness of that, but that was life in the 60s. And I was a real fan. So, there was a campaign in Cocoa Beach about 10 years or so ago to actually see, could we name a place in Cocoa Beach after I dream of Jenny? And they found a little lane, there's nothing very exciting about it at all, but they did get it named I Dream of Jenny. So keep going. There you go. Now, for those of you who know anything about the history of the place, no astronaut ever lived in Cocoa Beach. They certainly transited there and stayed in hotels while they were on flight call or something like that, as the Mercury guys did. But no one ever had a house that they called home in Cocoa Beach. And it certainly never looked like anything that you saw in I Dream of Genie. But anyway, we went to I Dream of Genie Lane. Next, now there is this motel, that's not where we stayed, but it's on the main drag of La Quinta. And 40, 50 years ago, that was um, briefly, I think owned, but certainly frequented by the Mercury astronauts. I think actually a few of them got together and bought it. And if you go in there, next one, this, helped, yeah, this hotel was first owned by the original seven astronauts. And, and it was. So there's a bit of history when you do a bit of research. I was cued to it by some of you guys, but when I actually found the address and went there. So again, this is another example of, it's not the obvious, it's not the big glossy thing, but it's history and it's living history. And you can go there and you can do it. Is that flat? So you used this belt. Yeah, that flat is stuck on there, which is pretty solid, isn't it? Yeah. So use yeah. this belt. It's not so yes. <laughs> What's that? Or no. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so yes. So yes. Yeah, yeah. That's American smell. Yeah, but it's so not. It's, it's not. Yeah, but Igor, it's not in English characters anyway. So if you are right, yes, so yes. So there you go. Oh, and part of the deal for um, attending the launch, part of your launch admission was you got a ticket, uh, a t-shirt, and instead of it being um, a NASA or Apollo or any t-shirt, it was an Atlas V launch t-shirt. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, uh, and then we, we continued driving all the way down. This is nearly the end of our trip. Uh, out to Key West, that's a lovely drive. Anyone seen the movie True Lies? There's yeah. no space link to this at all, so I like that this slide. Um, the Arnie and the so Atomic Bomb the bridge. Seven Mile Bridge, what? They fixed the bridge. They fixed the bridge. Well, they fixed one of the bridges. The other bridge is not fixed. There are two bridges there. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon that, that mark is, uh, the, the southernmost point is several kilometres. Yeah, no, it's a few hundred metres further down. It's, yeah. it's the southernmost part that the public can go to because the rest is on a military base. Yeah. The southernmost point is on a military base. And that's the end of Highway 1. And just walking back, I noticed this sign in the window. And I doubt very much that it stands for National Air and Noise and Space Administration. Yeah, well, that's not right either. Right, though, yeah. No. So moving right along, then we went. Oh yeah. Another thing I discovered down there was 
There was another White House. There's the summer White House of Harry Truman, the Truman administration. And Harry Truman used to take his holidays, not at Camp David or Mar El Lago, whatever that is. He, he used to go to Key West. And there was a White House down there. And it was also used by um, the Clintons and someone else used it. Maybe the Kennedys used it as well. Coming all the way back on our way home now, we did a tour of LA. I've been to LA many times. Not a big fan of LA, but we did a day tour because my son had never been there. Went back to Griffith Observatory, his first visit there. I'm an educator. I liked a lot of what I saw there from a teacher's point of view. Keep going. Things like oh, well, the Hollywood Land sign, minus the word land, because it was originally a, a real estate uh, advertising sign for a, an estate called Hollywood Land. And they took off the LAND. And the floor of Griffith, Griffith Observatory, scale model of the solar system, has a T tree. I always like that. And um, uh, a sundial, all very good. We're very close to the end, and that was, I think, the last slide. That was that was on um, Hollywood and Vine. That was on Hollywood Boulevard, yeah. And here we're back to the beginning. So there you go. But just, uh, my point was to show you that there is history there if you look for it. Just a little bit of research. You discover weird golf courses. You discover old houses. You never know what you might find. So not ostensibly a space tour, an R&R &R tour with the family, but a big space thing in there. And we got to go to a launch. So there you go. Thanks, Liam. Really uh, appreciate that. It was um, a month and two days, so 34 days for a while. But how you got away with it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a break. We're running as per usual, way late. So we'll just take a couple of minutes. We'll get Igor set up and then we'll get into Igor's presentation.
Yeah, it was a fabulous yeah. It was a fabulous It was a fabulous It was a fabulous It was a fabulous It was a It was Hi, my name is Igor Rosenberg. I'm a local expert on Russian space flight, Planet and Unmanned, and thank you, Peter, for wonderful introduction. In reality, I'm not uh, affiliated with the Russian Space Agency. However, I have some sorry, sorry. I have some connection with this website. For those of you who don't know, this is an site, uh, an website. Uh, about Russian space web, as name uh, put down. And my topic of my today presentation is lunar orbital platform gateway, mouthful. When I read this abbreviation, it's slightly different than previous one because it has more directives. The previous name of this international facility in this lunar space was DSG, Deep Space Gateway. I will talk briefly about what I would prefer as the name of new International Space Station around the moon, but today I would like to talk to you why decision has been made to establish a human present around the moon. Uh, Russia and, you, and US space, Russian and US space agency definitely came with a different rules to the same decision, so we will talk watch this facility how it could be represented, how it could be built, how much it will be, sorry, how much it might be cost, where it should be located, and what the benefits for all humanity it could serve. I have 40 slides. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. But we will have um, dedicated time, I believe, last five minutes in the end of the presentation. OK, topic. What we're going to discuss today, history of human moon exploration, deep space gate of a decision which actually happened here in Australia in September of last year, how NASA came to this decision, how Roscosmos came to this decision, what actually Russia is going to bring to the table or to program, and we will have a question, a question and answer session. Even uh, major agreement has been achieved by, Russia, uh, by NASA and Roscosmos. There are other agencies who already confirmed their presence in the pro participation in the program. It's Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency. There are some questions about Indian uh, space organization and Chinese. Potentially, it will be truly, um, some more partners, I believe, it will be more chances that this, pro this program will succeed. Three years ago, Patricia invited me to present history of lunar exploration for her group, which was monthly ast astronomy meeting. And even at that time, I talked about brave new plans about moon exploration, which in 2015, I didn't could not imagine that these plans are going to be eventually materialized and get funding. Before the, the time, before the September decision, which was on the gym. Okay, we, you heard about expression about lunar orbital infrastructure. In Apollo time, the only element of orbital infrastructure was Apollo spacecraft itself, which consisted from command and, command and service module and only command module serves, serves as a motherboard for a single astronaut, while two other 
astronauts actually landed on the moon. The same story, so obviously a polar program for which landed uh, men on the moon didn't have any other external lunar orbital, orbital facility apart from spa orbital spacecraft itself. The same applicable through Russian architecture, you can see uh, Soyuz 7K lunar orbital Karabrik, it's a lunar orbital spacecraft. None of them actually reach the moon, but there were few of them who tested, who were launched and tested on the low Earth orbit. By the way, uh, I was not able to find any logotype for Russian N1L3 program, which was supposed to put uh, Soviet cosmonaut, presumably Alexei Leonov, on the moon. Uh, even for constellation program, or Orion crew, crew exploration vehicle space, spacecraft did not assume to have any orbital infrastructure. So language has been slightly changed in recent years. When we're talking about return to the moon, and we're talking about elements of lunar orbital infrastructure, uh, both NASA, assuming that their spacecraft, which is in development from 2011, and Russian spacecraft, this unpronounceable name, PTK NP, which now has the designation of Federation, they have been designed in um, assumption that they, would not, they don't need to be in autonomous flight for 30 plus days. They have been designed as a part of the big explorational platform. Um, deep Space Gateway decision, we already discussed this. It has been announced on 27th of September on 68th International Astronomical Congress in capital of Southern Australia. It was, it was probably an unexpected event and slightly eclipsed announcement about Australia Space Agency and even presentation by Elon Musk because which was slightly unexpected. So, if you rephrase J, famous JFK quote, why, did, uh, why this boss agency choose to return to the moon? First of all, after well, Angelo already mentioned that after 2025, funding for International Space Station will be maybe not available, and due to US and China geopolitical competition, the US could be put in the corner when only available space station on uh, low Earth orbit would be Chinese one. So US has to make a move with this chess play and decided to, they have to put some money in order to preserve and became, became a leadership in space exploration. Uh, Again, Angelo already mentioned that NASA budget is very constrained. Russian space budget, I believe, even more constrained. So obviously, two countries decided to put all money together, just making sure that they can at least not duplicate on spending. Uh, there are a lot of talk about sustainable human space exploration. So unlike uh, earlier, Apollo mission, we're talking about return to the moon and we, that we're going to stay there for quite a while. It should not be just uh, uh, stripe and stars and boots on the ground. It has to be something more serious. In absence of landers, obviously, the choice would be to bring something intermediate for future exploration of lunar surface. Um, Again, NASA have a headache how to utilize space launch system and it's actually quite graceful exit from situation when they have rocket to nowhere. Um, again, deep space platform is going to support mission to moon, Mars and beyond in different way. Uh, we will talk about location where it will be in this lunar space, but if you have this capability, it obviously will take a lot of less money mass and effort to launch from this location to Moon, Mars, and beyond, rather than doing direct flight from Earth. 
Uh, I believe that uh, station will be built by delivering unmanned components via uh, it's called this LOR called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. So meaning that separate models will be uh, launched separately and assembly would happen on the lunar orbit. And again, while uh, we're concentrating in the next 10, 12 years to build our post lunar orbit, this should be a real gateway to lunar surface. You know, uh, as, long, as long as both sides would provide uh, man-rated lenders. And obviously to have something very close to the lunar surface mitigate risk for lunar land in can shake off. In case of emergency, effectively, you have a facility in half of day of the flight comparing with the four day of flights. Your lessons of Apollo 13 actually dictate that it should be much safe if you have something on lunar orbit just in case. And obviously, if you can access to lunar surface, which this facility will become a stepping stone for lunar, real lunar-based deployment or in European Space Agency terms the lunar village. Okay, this is national design which was um, created by Anatoly based on information in October 2017, probably one week. Um, after signing under, uh, agreement between NASA and Roscosmos. This will be the first model. It's called Power and Propul Propulsion Bus. Uh, at this stage, we know it probably will be launched in 2022 by, uh, uh, by probably, not by SLS, it should be launched most likely by Delta IV or another commercial carrier. So we're talking about this model. So this will be central model. Uh, unlike International Space Station, Russian model Zvezda, would not, similar to Zvezda, would not be used. This, this bird using uh, Xenon as a propeller, and we will chop wide enough to have Xenon with electrical um, rockets, rocket propulsion. Uh, two habitat modules, as you can see, they're not too big. We're talking about minimum version of ISS with a total volume probably less than near station on each completion. Why is that? Because it's very costly in terms of mass and in terms of money to deliver existing standard 20 ton models to this location. And we will talk about Russian proposal when they try to bring 25 ton model. Um, this is European proposal. Uh, because of st uh, station keeping on this orbit, uh, obviously power and propulsion model will have to use propellant. And this, is, this device is supposed to replenish propellant. European came with a solution that it should be a logistical uh, <coughs> vehicle, which is supposed to do transfer of propellant. Xenon actually is not uh, pumping uh, Xenon in space never has been done in such volumes, so it's still question. I would probably question how this technology, how much is this technology. And as you can see, it's not too big, just four tons. Could be delivered either by a new uh, Ariane a rocket or by Atlas V. Okay, location. <coughs> location, 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 location. Yeah. Um, I never heard about, okay, first time I heard term, term distance DRO, distance retrograde orbit, which was obviously from first, first launch of um, uh, Orion on Delta IV a couple of years ago. This is not, cap, cap, it's called not Kepler near orbit, and this is supposed to be a very stable environment if they approach a rock, so there are no chances that change foot would fall either on Earth or for the moon. So NASA chose and they insisted to choose this orbit. It's called near rectilinear orbit or in short words an NRO. As you can see all of these parameters in green except 
except this. Um, the cost of moving from this orbit, which actually highly ecliptical polar lunar orbit, is the uh, lowest distance from the moon 2,000 kilometers and highest uh, distance to the moon 75,000 kilometers. Everything was more or less okay, except it required approximately five kilometers per second of delta V. Delta V is a special parameter. Um, I can give you an example. In order to launch uh, a rocket uh, of super heavy class with all of the losses to uh, low Earth orbit, it's, it's approximately 10,000. 10,000 meters per second or 10 kilometers per second. You can imagine that this is almost half of the price to launch, uh, to, to create a return trip from, from station to orbit. But if you compare this all other um, contenders, and some of them were obviously L1 and L2, Lagrangian point, and there are some other orbits, this was selected as a, as a preferable one. And the biggest winner actually was this. Uh, even delta V from Lagrange point was comparable with this orbit. Uh, this was a winner in terms that required only half of day to move from orbit to lunar surface. So in case of emergency, if something happened on the lunar surface, rescue mission actually could be quite feasible in, in shortest possible time. Um, I will share with you this presentation. I don't have much time to talk about all of this orbital mechanic um, information. The good thing about this orbit as well, if you think about assembly Marshall uh, stack, uh, it required probably two small notches to move it from uh, NRO to Lagrange, the further Lagrange point in uh, Earth's lunar system, and after that probably another, 50, another small notch to move from Earth's lunar to Lagrange point to Earth's solar Lagrange point. And this is probably the better way to, to be because it required much, much less energy to launch Martian stack and probably even short, uh, make sure the uh, whole trip instead of six months, it should be, it should be less. Okay, moving on. NASA roadmap. NASA started talking about uh, lunar orbital facility. Um, obviously, nothing has been told about lunar orbital facilities. There are no mentioned in constellation program, which quietly died around 2010, which has been canceled by Obama's administration. Obama administration uh, authorized to use to use facility to bring asteroid, it's called IRM program. It has a manned part when astronauts are supposed to study this rock. And NASA work on next space technology for exploration partnership program. Next step, it's still valid now. Under this program, they selected, they trying to build the same uh, public partner, uh, public private partnership. Three companies have been funded to provide robotic moon lander. Six companies uh, provided some funds to do preliminary study for habitation model, uh, which would be used in, in, in lunar exploration as well. And five companies challenged with a task to provide feasibility study for power and propulsion model. As, and on this picture, you can see both uh, Orion and Russian spacecraft arriving to the station. Again, this architecture is national design. We would see something real, probably more realistic around here, starting from year 2022. This was Boeing vision. As you can see, uh, Boeing already have a vision when station would be built from relatively small models. Uh, approximately no more than 10 tons. So it's not, it wouldn't, it never ever would be a replica of OSS because of cost, because of distance. Plus it probably would be, considering the uh, high risk of radiation, it 
which probably would be man-tended station rather than uh, astronaut and cosmonaut will spend time permanently by years. Okay, Russian way of the gauge through this point. Uh, Roscosmos participated in global exploration program, which it was uh, quite solid absence of Russian uh, representative for last three years due to political climate. And Russia was concentrated on started Russian involvement. First, first serious proposal about Schwarner orbital station came from Kronichev, the guys who create uh, who manufacture proton, proton rockets. What they realize, they try to supplement uh, US constellation program by proposing this device. It's actually a manned spacecraft derived from TKS, which never started, which, which has been used in Russian space program twice, but it never had been launched with a crew on board. And their idea was to sell, first of all, second manned transportation um, system to NASA, plus they try to lobby Russian government for a very heavy, super heavy launch vehicle in order to deliver it 20 tons standard models of ISS, standard size model of ISS to the lunar orbit. Their proposal was for a low lunar orbit with the altitude of 100 kilometers. Obviously, they didn't get funding because nothing happened, but this was actually first serious study around 2007. Uh, and then again, Boeing uh, dream, seriously, seriously considered uh, uh, exploration platform in our um, small Lagrange Point 2. Even interestingly, Boeing chose originally something, a uh, model, main model of the station derived from the uh, model Zvezda. They still didn't believe that Russia is going to produce this spacecraft. So they consistently try to draw Soyuz. Even Energia decided they never ever going to put Soyuz uh, uh, on lunar orbit because otherwise they will cut their uh, funding short. It doesn't make for company to upgrade something if they can can get 10 times more money for brand new spacecraft. Um, and then yeah, I actually did some study with Lockheed Martin as well. If you look at this model, it's actually EBA model. This is what Russian are going to build. Originally, it's supposed to be US built model. Um, again, this is fantasy of the, of the um, Illustrator, the real stuff could be slightly different. Okay, Russian proposed to try to cannibalize some models from ISS, which they actually delayed because of funding, because of various reasons. This is called science and energy model. It weighed 25 tons, and Russian proposed to use to use it as a base for station. Unfortunately, it required it required launch of SLS, which which would be probably cost two billion dollars. So this proposal didn't get uh, approval from NASA only because of uh, money issue, uh, constrained by money. This was a, approved. Uh, this is what Russian proposed in 2017. This model weighs exactly nine. Uh, 9,000 kilos, and it can be delivered during SLS manned mission um, as an auxiliary payload. They call it copayload co manifest. So this is maximum. This is why all models for station uh, could be could be which arrive on SLS uh, have a limit of 9,000 uh, kilograms. Uh, this is was original proposal, and yeah, we talk about uh, and NAM, and NAM originally was supposed to be launched to uh, uh, to ISS orbit by Proton, which has effectively payload of 25 tons, could be delivered to the moon to this location only by SLS, which has 
separating total capacity. You can you can now compare shear difference, the same model, how 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 expensive in terms of mass to launch it to, to destination. Um, okay, this is both original design for I, ISS. Um, it's called it's originally called EVM model, now it's called a multi-purpose model. Um, and this is what derived design which will be used in um, in uh, a lunar orbital platform. Um, this design is not complete because I believe now they trying to add another section somewhere which would use for storage of space use. They try to, uh, to keep at least two American and two Russian space use somewhere because they don't, they don't have additional space. So this model potentially would have would get uh, another review. Um, okay, what else Russia can bring to the table? Um, this is international standard for docking unit. It has been space war since originally it has been tested in 1975 during the Apollo mission. Interestingly, the same standard, uh, one of the MIR models have the same docking system. They even launch one Soyuz spacecraft uh, equipped with this unit. And this has became de facto standard for everybody. For Japanese models, for European models, the, this is where energy is actually going to get some money because uh, all party accepted this as a standard inter interface, stand as a single, single standard for docking. Potentially, it, at the moment, it's qualified only for 30 tons. I believe it's enough for uh, lunar models, which wouldn't be too heavy, but Russians probably would uh, create more improved version because of, uh, of their design of their transportation system. Obviously, it has been used on ISS and before this on, on, on near station. And it's supposed to be used on Russian shuttle as well. Okay. So, Roscosmos plan to, to how they're going to build space transportation, new, gener new generation space transportation system. Um, during three days before Falcon Heavy, when everybody waited with anticipation, uh, I believe most people missed one interesting fact. Uh, President Putin signed executive order so it's not only Trump for doing this, uh, which actually gave green light to starting uh, development of super heavy launch vehicle. It was one step forward and two step back story with super heavy launch vehicle. I believe for us at least for us ten years uh, in one form or other, but at least now they're going to build a super heavy launch vehicle and. Fortunately, unfortunately, they're not going to go on energy, which was an energy brand. It should be a different vehicle. How many tons? Um, it should be another slide. There are three, three different, uh, more different um, configurations. Uh, again, in January was an announcement about creating space tap, cryogenic space tap. It's not uh, in uh, plus in the same class as the um, exploration upper stage. It's probably twice less, and we will talk in more details about this. And Energia is still pushing uh, one piece of legacy from M1. It will be space dark oxygen kerosene, uh, which called MOB-DM. It's based on the, uh, it's derived from block dm upper stage, which actually has been used for the need proton, and it's going to be used on Angara launchers. Another piece of puzzle to the right size spacecraft. Uh, Russians working on lunar surface success model. It's a membraneated lander. Surprisingly, it will uh, be around 20 tons. While first membraneated uh, lander based on the commercial program would be similar to Russian lander uh, from N1 program, like five tons. So it's one man vehicle. This is what NASA proposing right now. Who's liking that? Uh, we don't know because restriction of the funding, which was not included in, in 
in federal space program. Uh, in N1 program, which, made, which was made in Ukraine, so there is no way it should be done. So most likely energy or energy, most likely. And obviously they working on ground system. Cosmogram was touched at the moment, is capable only to launch Soyuz true rockets, but it would be placed for super, super heavy launch vehicle. Much time to have. Okay. Okay, this is answer for your question. What are you going to do with uh, space transportation system? This is replacement of the need. In diameter 4.1 meters, they're going to use uh, uh, this first stage would be used as a booster for all three configurations. Uh, Energia 3 car would be capable to bring 50 tons. Energia 6 car 80 H tons. And Energia 6 KV 100 H tons. To where? Uh, low Earth orbit. So, okay. Potentially they're going to be about this to 100 stage, at least in, in uh, timing, 2027, 2028, 2032, they're planning for lunar landing of Russian cosmonauts in 2030. Again, I don't believe this timeline, but we'll see. And this is how much it cost in US dollars. So what they really have to develop after Soyuz 5 will be developed. First two stages will be ready. They, they have to concentrate on this by hydrogen propellant third stage. They don't have engine for this, and I, I'm very doubtful that they can make them in the next 10 years. Um, this is space tank. Engines actually would be surprised, but they are derived from US RL Chen. The Russian did not steal this technology. They actually cooperated with the Pratt and Whitney, and they can. They have an analog of RL chain engines. Uh, yeah, this is where Mob DM is going to be used. Uh, this is spacecraft, which I probably show you a couple of times. Uh, it's very similar by architecture to uh, Orion, which has this descent model, which can see it from pressurized uh, cabin and from rear uh, rear compartment. And it has service model which has propulsion. Uh, yeah, this is different configuration of lenders. I don't have time, sorry, I have to speed up. Uh, this is evolution of ra Russian cargo vehicle. This vehicle would be absolute jam because it can fit this 9,000 uh, kilo, kilo, 9 ton kilo limit, and it could be delivered as a co payload on SLS if it's necessary. Uh, they calculated, they tried to build system which based on containers and uh, based on both DM energy and each can deliver container by itself without any other vehicle. The top probably would be a little bit above five tons. Uh, yeah, this was the idea of using uh, a space tank system which could be probably quite handy to bring uh, a lander from orbit and back in order to save fuel and lander itself. If you have this one on lunar orbit and you have two of them, you can actually save on, on size of on generated lunar lander. And this is what plan looks like for Russians. 2022 first launch from Baikonur on Soyuz 5. 2023, another launch, and it will be ISS automatic mission. 2024, first uh, manned mission. 2027, Federate, uh, Federation spacecraft should be launched, uh, should be launched and dock this uh, lunar orbital station, which has to be already five years in orbit, at least. And they're planning at least during 2030-2032 moon landing. Uh, I don't have time for this. You're welcome. I will share this presentation, so you're welcome to look at it. This is Jerry Maguire quote, show me the money. This is probably what US going to spend on, uh, this is original request for 2019 for NASA. 
exploration system development that actually managed going through SLS, Orion, and ground facility. And advanced exploration system, it's a money which going to be used for to, to deploy lunar orbital platform. As you can see for next five years plan, it's four times less than rocket and spacecraft. I don't know how sustainable it is, but at least there are money which can be spent and actually Russians I believe truly believe that some of this money would be felt into into, into their pockets. Um, okay, names. When I first heard the expression Deep Space Gateway, it reminded me of this, Deep Space Nine, Star Trek, into the Galactical Gateway. There is a book about Gateway and they are serious. I would suggest they have to name new lunar orbital station by any of the Greek Roman goddesses that are plenty of choice to choose from. This is how station could be deployed and I believe my time is up. Thanks Igor for fantastic. Um, we always run out of time as usual so sorry about that bit. Pressing time. We've just been in touch with security so we've got a, about 20 minutes left here in the room. So. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Best thanks, though. So now we're going to move over to Andrew Rennie, who is our planetary science expert. And I'm just going to bring up his uh, presentation. Are you going to go to Mark? No, I don't think I can. I'm going to be on the online meeting. Are you going to go? Yeah, I guess so. I'll see you on the... Okay, excellent. Good idea. Right, my name's Andrew Rennie. I'm the producer of the Space Show. And Treasure of Planetary Summary. A number of missions that I mentioned last month are going to one of the or other of the Lagrange points. Igor has just mentioned the uh, lunar Lagrange points. So I thought it might be an idea to just run through what are the Lagrange points, how do they work. Now this is going to be extremely simplified and missing some of the subtle points. So the mass of the sun is around about 2 by 10 to the power of 30 kilograms. The mass of the earth is a lot smaller and around about 6 by 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. There's a thing called a universal gravitational constant, otherwise known as big G, and it's around about 6.7 by 10 to the power of minus 11 meters cubed to kilogram to minus one seconds to minus two. A year is 365.242 days, and one day, this is the Earth day, is 86,400 seconds. So that's the basic day that we start with. Okay, next one. The gravitational force between any two masses, capital M, small m, is F equals G M M over R squared, where R is the distance between the two masses. Now this could be between you and me, between two atoms, or between uh, two planets, or the, a sun and a planet, or whatever. Okay. Gravitational field strength, acceleration due to gravity, is big G times the mass of the object over R squared. So for example, the gravitational field strength of me, on you, is big G times my mass, divided by the square of the distance between us. Centipedal force, when something's going around like this, to keep my hand there, there has to be a centripetal force pulling in towards the center. And that is given by the mass, that's in the case of my hand, going around, times the square of the linear velocity, 
tangential velocity divided by the radius of the another's length by hour. So that's the centipede of force. An object that's doing that is that it's actually accelerating. Well, that's going at a constant speed. It is actually, actually accelerating towards the center. Now, that's a bit of a harder concept to understand. And that acceleration is v squared over pi r. And the other thing we need to know is the circumference of a circle is 2 times pi times r. Now, for a planet going around the sun, say I'm the sun and then my hand's the planet, the centripetal force is provided by gravity, the gravity between the two objects. So the centripetal force has to equal the gravitational force if that orbit is to be stable. So as, it goes, as the Earth, say, goes around the sun, on the sun, there's the Earth, then that force is provided by gravity. Right, let's go on to the next picture. Now at this point, I decided that doing it in, uh, you know, with computer stuff was too hard. It was taking too long, so I switched to doing it by handwriting and scanning it in. Okay, so at L1, the Earth and L2 all move around the sun at the same angular velocity, in other words, at the same period. In other words, they take the same time to go around. So in the case of a L1 and L2 for the Earth, it takes one year to go around. That means that they're going in different linear velocities. And I've written the velocity at the top there. 2.957 by 10 to the power 4 meters per second. Now, L1 is approximately 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. That's about 1% of the distance to the Sun. Likewise, L2, as we'll show in a few moments, is about the same distance the other way. So, 150 million kilometers is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, approximately, and L1 is 1% of that, so that's 1.5 million kilometers, uh, yeah, 1.5 million meters, this is meters now. And so the distance of L1 from the sun is 148 point, uh, wait, you can see the number there, from the sun. Now, next slide. So an object at L1, We'll have a centripetal acceleration given by A equals B squared upon R, which da, 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 falls out when you do the calculation to be 5.887. Now I know the significant figures, you don't do them, but I'll put them in anyway. 5.887 by 10 to the power of minus 3 meters per second squared, or if you prefer, newtons per kilogram. That's the force on each kilogram, that's at L1. Okay, next picture. So an object in L1 will experience a solar gravitational field strength of gm of the sun over r squared. And when you do that, so that calculation it turns out to be 6.02 newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. But you'll notice that that 6.02 is greater than the 5.887 that we showed you earlier. So an object in L1 is going too slow to be held in position and it should fall towards the sun. Well, it wouldn't fall directly towards the sun, it would just the, go into an elliptical orbit where the perihelion is closer than that distance. Right. But the object is also in the Earth's gravitational field. So, what's the gravitational field strength of the Earth at that point? Well, acceleration of gravity due to the Earth is gm, mass of the Earth over r squared, and the works through the calculation, and it turns out to be about 0.177 meters per second squared. Now, the difference between these two calculations of the accelerations, or gravitational field strength, is 6.02 by minus 5.887 is about 0.133. Next picture. 
and that is about equal to 0.177 that we showed you earlier. Considering that the Earth's orbit is not exactly 150 million kilometers, that the mass of the Earth's atmosphere is not being accounted for in the, when I did the mass of the calculation of the Earth, the distance to L1 is not exactly one and a half million kilometers, and there's rounding errors or uncertainties. So here is my little cal picture here now. We've got the Earth pulling on that way. We've got the Sun pulling that way. And the centipede acceleration that's needed to go around the Sun at that speed that we keep it matched with the Earth is the Sun pulling this way, the Earth pulling that way equals that vector there, which is the centipede acceleration needed at that point to go around the sun at the speed it is going at there. So if it were the Earth wasn't there and you wanted to keep it at that distance, it'd have to go a lot faster to just stay there. You know, the, the closer to the sun, the faster and you go, the further out, the slower you go. So there we are. An L1, an object moving too slow to remain in orbit, but the outward pull of the Earth prevents the object from falling towards the Sun. So that it's balanced. Now, one thing which I'm not going into are the halo orbits, but you can do a vector calculation to show that the, the Sun pulling that way and the Earth pulling that way results in the result which actually pulls towards the center, and so you can actually orbit L1 uh, in that way. Right, next picture. So, if we do a similar calculation for L2, we've got the Sun, we've got the Earth, and L2 is out here. The object in L2 now is moving too fast for the Sun's gravity to provide the centripetal force needed for circular motion. So, it would fly outwards. In other words, it would go out into an elliptic orbit, which has an aphelion further away than L2 is. But, the Earth's gravitational pull adds to the Sun's pull to provide the necessary centripetal force. So here we have Sun, Earth, L2. The acceleration needed to stay in orbit there at that distance at the speed it needs to be matched with the Earth is the pull of the Sun in that direction plus the pull of the Earth in that direction that plus that equals the centipedal force needed. And uh, I think that was the last slide. Yeah. So, the very oversimplified is an explanation of how it is that we've got the Lagrange points L2 here and L1 there. Of course, these are vectors are not to scale, but that's it. And that's used, as uh, Igor said, it's going to be used in the, or would be used in a Russian concept and it's the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be in the halo orbit around L2. We have got quite a few spacecraft in orbit around L1, including the famous SOHO uh, craft, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. Andrew, how, how big are the halo orbits can you get? How far from L1 can you actually go above and below? Well, there comes a point when you, when you get too far away from the this is just okay, L2. When you get so the Soho spacecraft's in orbit takes six months, Halo orbit six months, right? And uh, I'm not sure exactly how far away that is from the center in kilometers, but it's quite a distance. And all the spacecraft are a thing. Because if you put a spacecraft exactly at L1, you've got your antenna receiving antenna receiving data back, is pointing straight at the sun, which is not a healthy thing for your antenna. So what you do is you have it offset. So when you look at the sun, you know, go out tomorrow, look at the sun, da -da, and think just a little way up to the side, there are a number of spacecraft going in orbit around that. Right. They're more than a solar damage away, and most of them are in a six month halo orbit. Please okay. don't. And that halo orbit, by the way, is not entirely perpendicular. So this halo orbit here 
you might think it's up and down going like that, but in fact it, it usually goes more like this at an angle. So the Hubble Space Telescope, so not Hubble, the uh, James Webb is going to be placed here, and there's a, a number of other craft are there. So it's highly oversimplified. I'm sorry for those who know the physics. Yes, Lynn, I knew you'd have something. Well, look, very quickly, if there had been a natural object orbiting at 99% of the uh, Earth's radius, Earth's orbital radius, say an L1 radius, would it be captured by L1? No, it's not stable. No, that's L4 right. and L5 are stable. L1 and L2 are metastable points, and if you yeah. wander too far three. away from them, you will drift away, you'll be captured yes. by the sun. Uh, NASA were looking for alien presence in uh, Earth's moon system, Lagrange 4 and Lagrange 5. SETI, not NASA, sorry. SETI program were looking. They didn't find anything. Really they didn't find anything. Uh, Couldn't have predicted that. Well, hey, we found the dark project. Sadly, we've run out of time. As for you, we always seem to cut the end off and really apologize for that. But we do need to get out of this building. So listen, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. It's been really nice to see you. We're going to be back here again next month, the 26th of March. We'll uh, advertise our program uh, as we get closer to that. I think Mike's already got something lined up. Um, but anyway, thanks again and um, have a great night and uh, bring your friends on. And visit Suns with Space Association, the website at space.acent.au to get membership details, meeting details, and to all the other Thank you.